Iris. I knew something was wrong the moment I stepped out of the car. The summer air hung dead and limp upon my shoulders like a heavy blanket as I made my way up to the temple at the top of the cliff. Gravel crunched loudly under my feet. The leafy trees around me stood motionless in the thick, still air, festooned with luckless wind socks, downed kites, immobile pinwheels, and other offerings left by desperate worshippers. Something bad had happened at the Temple of Wind. It was my job to find out just how bad. A hand-lettered sign taped to the gates indicated the temple was closed for a private ceremony. That in itself was a bad sign. Estros was never big on privacy, not for himself nor his priesthood. I pushed the intercom button, glancing up at the security camera perched on top of the entrance. The voice that crackled through the speakers managed to sound both bored and anxious at the same time. Please read the sign. The High Temple of Estros Wind Tamer is closed to public worship today. My name is Iris Thoro. I serve at the whim of Themia, the Huntress of Justice, I said. I eased Themia's blessed oak branch, which marked me as a Justix, out of its belt loop and waved it in front of the camera. Know how many times I've heard that one today? Take your offerings and go home. I noticed there was no blinking red light on that camera. Interesting. Look, you and I both know Themia doesn't look kindly on those who bandy her name about. Send someone down here and I'll show them my credentials. A hiss of sound. Another pause. Then some more white noise. Wait just a minute. I heard the crunch of footsteps behind me. My hand tightened around the handle of my oak. I could do quite a bit of damage with the goddess-blessed wood. Themia was practical in regards to arming her servants. If you can't trust a priestess of the goddess of justice, who can you trust? My hand relaxed, marginally. Andy Ariki. Wonders never cease. I turned around. Wait, are you wearing a suit? Like it? The demigod tugged at the lapels. It was a nice cut in a soft gray that set off the darkness of his skin, as well as the iridescent scales on his cheekbones and the turquoise sheen in his hair that gave away his pantheonic heritage. But Andy didn't do suits. Hells, he didn't do shirts if he could help it. Figured it would make me look more responsible. Why do you suddenly care about looking responsible? I'm just here to ask questions. Same as you. Themia anointed me to this case two hours ago. The oil on my eyelids had barely dried. How in hells do you have questions? He shrugged. Word travels fast in the Pantheon. You let me into the temple as your partner, maybe I'll be nice and share what I know. Oh, I'm sure Themia would just love that. Rome presents... Gods and Lies. Episode 1. Justixes didn't typically work with criminal informants, but Andy existed in a diplomatic gray area. One of the benefits of being the consequence of a turbulent cruise ship tryst between a lounge singer and the sea mother. Demigods are a mixed bunch. Some have powers, some can't tie their shoes. Some are stable, some are barely house-trained. Any deity who sleeps around without protection is rolling the dice, and legislating demis is a whole other can of worms. A demi who remains on his immortal parent's good side can get away with just about anything. Andy had towed the thinning line of the sea mother's patience for years. But this was a particular case. The smell of Themia's incense clung to my clothes, and I could still feel the overpowering rush of the goddess's regard, of her trust, from when she had emphasized the importance of discretion when dispensing justice. Discretion and a delicate touch. Andy, charming and useful as he could occasionally be, was about as subtle as an air horn. And yet, if I left him out here unsupervised, he would just find some other way to cause trouble. 
when a barefoot priestess in light blue robes finally came up to the gates to check for my blessed oak, I fought back my misgivings and waved toward Andy. He's with me. As the gates opened, I nudged him. Provided you behave. Estros's temple was designed to be bright and open concept. Few walls, light materials, that sort of thing. On a normal day, the temple seemed like a living thing. Banners and ribbons snapping and unfurling, wind chimes tinkling, priests in flapping robes floating in and out like helpful birds. Today, in this stark, immobile air, the temple looked like an abandoned skeleton picked apart by scavengers, the flaccid rugs and banners dripping down like shreds of dead skin. The priestess who welcomed us looked to be just shy of forty, with a few flecks of gray at her temples. Her brown hair was pulled back into a mass of braids, each one adorned with a bell. In the absence of wind, her braids swished and thumped against her back with every step like a cat o' nine tails. Greetings, Justixes. I am the high priestess of this temple. You may call me Mother Daphne. I take it you're here to examine the crime scene. May you be blessed to receive Themia's justice, I replied, as was the custom, I apologize in advance for my assistant. Hey, said Andy. I hope your patron goddess conveyed to you the delicacy of this matter, Mother Daphne said. Her voice quavered. It's been a very great shock to all of us within the wind tamer's halls. Would you like to see the body? Lead the way, I said. Andy, for once, said nothing. He merely tugged uncomfortably at his tie. The priestess led us through the eerily quiet temple to the high altar reserved for all major public services. Carved out of a single piece of blue-veined white marble and surrounded by four statues representing the four winds, it was installed at the cliff's highest point, within an airy pagoda that overlooked the ocean. A lone seagull squatted on the north-facing statue and quarked at my approach. There was still a sacrifice on the altar. I recognized the black-spotted plumage of a kestrel, a bird particularly favored by Estros. It was lying beak up, its wings extended, its chest cut open. Grooves in the stone directed the animal's dried blood down into a ceremonial basin beneath the altar. An ashen-faced novice who didn't look older than eighteen stood guard beside it, twisting the folds of his robe in his hands. I thought you said there was a body. Andy said. You're looking at it. The high priestess stepped forward and placed a comforting hand on the novice's shoulder. Brother Abe, show the representatives of justice what you showed me. With a jerky nod, the novice turned the kestrel onto its back. It was my turn to clean the altars in the morning, but when I showed up, the bird, I mean, the body, was already there. When I tried to collect it, I noticed... I noticed... I eased closer as he gently pulled back some of the feathers on the bird's left shoulder, revealing a glimpse of a black and purple design etched onto the skin. May I? The boy nodded, limp with relief, and let me take over. Beneath the plumage, the design was stretched, distorted, but still recognizable an elaborate pea made up of flowers, gems, and vines. I'm not the world's greatest expert on raptors, but I'm pretty sure they're not huge fans of personalized tattoos. You recognize the design? The boy nodded again, weaving a bit on his feet. I couldn't blame him. This was new territory, even for me. Pippa showed it to me once when she first arrived. Said she planned on adding more onto it once her classes were over. Oh, she... Andy swallowed the rest of his expletive. It sounded like he had to swallow something else back as well. You're telling me that bird used to be a person? Mother Daphne sighed. So it seems. She also has an appendectomy scar on her abdomen, and she's missing the last toe on her right foreleg. Pippa lost hers to infection when her parents first immigrated here. You examined the body? I asked. The priestess tensed. 
I had to be sure of what we were dealing with. This isn't something that happens every day. Andy leaned forward and placed his hand over hers, oozing sympathy out of every handsome pore. No judgment. In your shoes, I would have done the same thing. So who was she? I asked. The high priestess took a photograph out of her pocket and gave it to me. A small, slight outlander woman with pale blue eyes and wheat-colored hair stared out at me. Her name was Philippa Marwall, Pippa for short. She lived here at the temple. A priestess? She served Estros. The high priestess's eyes flickered toward the blessed oak at my hip. The oak only detected outright lies, not omissions or half-truths, but the priestess's reaction was indication enough. Out with it. She was a student down at the university. For the last eight months, she boarded with us due to her particular... affiliation with Estros. Affiliation? An unpleasantly familiar, prickling heat crawled over my skin. You mean favored? She grimaced. We prefer the term affiliated. We're not in the dark ages anymore. He didn't swoop down and carry her off to his lair. She presented a scientific paper at some seminar or other. He was the keynote deity. They established a connection. How romantic, I drawled. She wasn't some damsel in distress. You're right. She is most definitely beyond distress. I swept my gaze over her mutilated, transformed corpse. The seagull squawked from its perch as if in agreement. Mother Daphne's face flushed with angry color. We want this solved as much as you do. The wind tamer is devastated. Then where is he? I asked. She clammed up the fire of her anger snuffing out as quickly as a blown candle. I don't know. That's convenient. The gods don't exist for our convenience. He's probably in mourning. The priestess stared at me as if I'd gone crazy. Heat washed over my skin. Maybe I was crazy. But the gods didn't always respect human laws. Not if those laws interfered with their desires. He wasn't exactly known for his restraint. Didn't he tear off his own right arm to prove he could wrestle the sun god one-handed? And he won, didn't he? Andy cut in, stepping in front of me. We all know how this looks. His voice was soft and soothing, a cool glass of water after a blast of heat. Believe me, Mother Daphne, it would be easy if it were Estros. If he didn't do this, it means someone else wants us to think he did. Someone determined to drag the Wind Tamer's name through the mud. That's someone who should be stopped at all costs. Wouldn't you agree? Of course. Mother Daphne lapped up every last drop of that cool water voice, straightening like a thirsty flower. You see why we need to know every detail. We need to clear Estros's name before this story gets out. And we know it will. Andy sounded so reasonable, so responsible. Damn, wearing a suit did work. The high priestess's mouth snapped shut. The temple of Estros is happy to cooperate with the representatives of justice. Why don't we talk in my office? You're welcome, Andy murmured as we followed the priestess down from the altar. I didn't need your help. Thankfully, my oak wasn't blessed to respond to my own half-truths. Andy seemed to guess at my thoughts because he laughed. Okay, so he could be charming when he wanted to be, when he wasn't having his ass pulled out of a self-started fire by yours truly. But why was he even involved in this case? Andy didn't serve a higher calling. He served himself. Mother Daphne's office looked like the most structured room in the temple. Four sliding paper doors were arranged to form a private space, surrounding a low desk covered in, unsurprisingly, a fleet of paperweights. 
She gestured for us to sit upon the two floor cushions in front of the desk. Andy sat with his natural, God's-given grace. I managed it a little more stiffly. Can you run us through the timeline? I asked. Brother Abe found Pippa at 5.30. Normally, one of us checks on the altars and shrines during the night to make sure the lamps are still lit, but we had a bit of a plumbing emergency yesterday. The new water heater burst, and I spent the day supervising a lot of tired novices with buckets. She pinched her mouth flat to stop it from trembling. After that debacle, I didn't have the heart to send anyone on the night rounds. It didn't seem like a priority. I had no idea... Of course, Andy cut in soothingly. You couldn't have known. Is that when you contacted the Temple of Justice? Abe made the call, actually. By rights, he should have woken me first, but as you can see, his instincts were correct. I found out around six. What about the broken security camera at the gate? I asked. That thing? She flushed. It was never working to begin with. We've had a few cases of vandalism in the last few months. Estros was starting to take offense, and since I didn't like the idea of some silly teenager having to spend a few years as a seagull, I had the camera installed up there to scare them off. So what security do you have? Estros installed wind wards around the more important areas of the temple. Nothing lethal, you understand. Anyone trying to open a door they shouldn't gets pushed back by a blast of wind whether it's one person or thirty armored men in a van. And we've tested them. They're all at full strength. Why only certain areas? Mother Daphne shrugged. We worship the god of wind. The wind is free, swift, unencumbered, and our order strives to reflect that. We don't lock doors. We don't bolt windows. We don't collect material possessions just for the sake of owning them. We have very few items worth stealing. And what would those items be? I asked. The priestess cleared her throat. In keeping with the Three Mothers ruling on magical items, Estros keeps his relics and artifacts of exceptional power under lock and key. I tried not to lean forward too obviously. Pippa Marwal had been transmogrified. There were only three things on Earth that could perform magic like that. Gods, certain demigods, and humans using relics, objects imbued with a god's power. Centuries ago, Pantheon members used to empower relics by the dozens in order to arm and reward their human followers. But those items kept their destructive power long after their intended owners died and less worthy owners stepped up to take their place. Eventually, it got bad enough that the Sea Mother, Sky Mother, and Earth Mother brought playtime to an end and ordered their children to pick up their toys. What few exceptions remained, the lower-grade relics required for sacred duties, like my Blessed Oak, were ruthlessly regulated. Gods didn't always adhere to human laws, but the word of the Three Mothers was final. The result? A thriving trade for bounty hunters returning relics to the gods who made them, and an equally powerful black market dedicated to keeping those items in human hands. So, all present and accounted for? I pressed. I would be happy to provide you with an inventory. Mother Daphne answered with an arched eyebrow. Yes, thank you. Disappointing. That eliminated one pretty big motive. Would we be able to see Pippa's room? Andy. Luck was a funny thing. I thought about Luck as I followed Iris and the High Priestess deeper into the Temple of Wind toward the girl's room. No, not the girl, Pippa. I thought I'd have to work my way in to see Pippa with my suit and a smile. Mother knew I had nothing else to my name these days. But along came Iris, the one priestess in the Temple of Justice who didn't want to arrest me just on principle. Lucky for me, less so for Pippa. I thought of the envelope tucked into the inside pocket of my suit 
and a wave of nausea swept over me at the memory of her body, transformed almost completely beyond recognition. It set up a sickening countercurrent to the pulse of the sea in my head. We arrived at Pippa's room. Sliding door, no lock, like every other room in this place. Iris scanned the area from top to bottom, frowning as if the room was an uncooperative suspect. It wasn't what I'd expected either. A comfortable double bed stood against one wall, with a pair of pretty purple ballet flats tucked beneath the covers. A desk leaned against the other wall with an open laptop and a stack of textbooks on it. A wardrobe in the far corner. A chair with a ratty hoodie thrown over the back. It certainly didn't look like a prison, but it wasn't the epitome of luxury either. It felt more like an upscale dorm room. Iris stepped in, ignoring the high priestess's squeak of outrage, and started going through Pippa's wardrobe. I caught a glimpse of more hoodies, worn jeans, cozy sweaters, an earring stand in the shape of a dryad, tinkling with colorful drugstore jewelry. My eyes drifted to the small spiral tattoo on the back of Iris's neck, between where her dark pixie cut ended and the collar of her temple-issued Justix jacket began. Everything about her was short and precise including her temper. The biggest thing about her was her mouth, and maybe her moves. She could wield that blessed oak branch like a wild thing. But her people skills were sadly lacking. Iris knew the law, but I knew people. She would need me if she didn't want to set off a feud between the Temple of Wind and the Temple of Justice. Maybe I could still get something out of this after all. Smiling broadly at Mother Daphne, I made my way to Pippa's desk, although I wasn't sure what I was looking for. Notebooks, maybe? A journal? I picked a notebook up. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Iris purse her lips, but she left it alone. It looks like Pippa was comfortable here, I remarked to the high priestess. I flipped open the notebook. It was full of neatly ordered notes and equations written in blue-black ink, dated and organized by class. Girl was working a decent course load at Nexos U, why would someone in need of rescuing still attend class and take such diligent notes? For that matter, why was someone favored by a god pursuing a degree? She wasn't particularly demanding, Mother Daphne said, thawing a little. I think she was studying chemistry. Engineering, actually, I said, riffling through her notes. The high priestess shrugged. I barely scraped through high school science, so I'll have to take your word for it. Pippa didn't share very much of her life with us. I tucked my surprise behind a reassuring smile. That was unusual. I'd met more than a few favorite humans in my day. Some of the gods still brought them along to council meetings. They sat at the back, sharing gossip, comparing perks, drinking watered-down ambrosia. Not a bad lot, all in all. But most favored lived like they couldn't spend money fast enough like they had to suck every last drop out of the experience. Which was smart. A god's favor rarely lasted long. What about Estros? What were his views on sharing? There was Iris's big mouth to trample what little rapport I was trying to build. Look at this place. Being favored typically comes at a higher price point, doesn't it? I beg your pardon? I stepped in. What she means is... It looks like Pippa wasn't favored for the more typical reasons. The Windfather must have seen something different in her. Iris shot me a glare. Naturally, the High Priestess said, somewhat mollified. So what did Estro see in her? Iris asked. Mother Daphne blinked a few times. One cannot presume to know the reasons of a god. Perhaps he admired her cunning mind for physics. Engineering. Whatever. Translation, the high priestess didn't know either. That was interesting. Iris tried another tactic. Her voice inexpertly packaged into a professional tone. Did Pippa communicate anything to you about feeling unsafe in the temple? Not in so many words, Mother Daphne replied. She kept to herself. None of us knew her all that well. While Iris and the High Priestess were distracted, I casually slid open some of Pippa's drawers, found a few more notebooks, more scribbles from her classes, textbooks, sensible clothing, but nothing truly personal 
No makeup, no birth control pills, not even any photographs. This gal didn't look like she had any connections to anyone. And whose choice was that? What about her family? Iris asked. I slipped my hand into the pocket of the hoodie Pippa had thrown over her chair. It still smelled faintly of laundry soap, like it had just come out of the wash. She hadn't had time to wear it for very long. I swallowed a victory whoop as my fingers closed around a familiar rectangle. Pippa's family never set foot in this temple, Mother Daphne said. I made sure of that. Wait, what? I jerked my hand back so fast, Pippa's cell phone nearly clattered to the floor. Why? Iris demanded. Her temper gave me the diversion I needed to slip the girl's phone into my pocket, but I echoed her sentiment. Because she asked us to, the priestess shot back. It was the one thing she was absolutely firm on. No contact, no phone calls, no visits, no letters. Do you know why? Iris asked. I never asked, the priestess said, a defensive note thrumming in her voice. You could guess, I offered. The priestess shot me a look of relief, as if I'd handed her a lifeline. She, her family, they're outlanders, stepped off the boat barely ten years ago. You know how those kind are. They can barely tell divining incense from a scented candle. You'd find it hard to maintain a god's favor, too, if you always had to explain their bumbling errors. Of course, I said. Iris shot me a sour look. The Pantheon could be... complicated. Even for people who worship them their entire lives. Hells, I have a backstage pass to a number of their antics, and even I missed a step a time or two. Unfortunately, depending on the god, if their sacrificial lamb turned out well done instead of medium rare, you could come home to find a crater where your house used to be. This was why most folks chose a single patron deity once they turned 18, preferably one with clout. Easier to keep track of prayers to a single god, and they, in turn, kept their lesser brethren off your back. This was also why most native worshippers avoided outlanders. Imagine a foreigner from some literally godforsaken country landing on our shores for the first time, not knowing which end of the life-giving chalice is up. Would you want anything to do with them? Craters do awful things to a neighborhood's property values. Sure, it wasn't fair, but you really can't argue with a smoking crater. Iris's lip curled. So you think our victim rejected her family because she was ashamed of her heritage? Clearly it doesn't matter what I think, Mother Daphne replied. She huffed in an angry breath, probably inhaling the very last of her patience. You're the servant of justice. I'm sure you'll figure it out. Do you at least have an address for them? I might have a copy of it written down somewhere. Iris glanced at me out of the corner of her eye. I could practically see her debating with herself on whether to trust me or not. She sighed. All right. Andy here can take that information. I need to make a call. Why? I asked. Iris turned her disapproving Justix face fully onto me now. Damn, it was uncomfortable being on the wrong end of that look. You want to work with me or not? This is the work. I tried to come up with a reply, but any words of explanation died on my tongue. They'd only set off her blessed oak. Instead, I nodded like the idiot she clearly thought I was. As Iris turned away, I took out a notebook and scribbled down the high priestess's directions, but I was only half listening. The Marwall family knew something was going to happen to their daughter. That's why they'd hired me to contact her. What was I going to tell them now that I was too late? Iris. I marched out into the smothering air and called my friend Amelia on my cell. She picked up on the second ring. Iris, babe, does this call mean we're on for the concert? Business, not pleasure, I replied. I've got an autopsy for you. A weird one. How weird? Transmogrification weird. How familiar are you with avian anatomy? I asked. After a moment's hesitation, the death priestess said, 
Okay, you officially have my attention. What's the catch? The catch is I need this done quietly, or at least as quietly as possible. I might actually have to use some subtlety with this case. Subtle? You? Can you do it or not? I asked. Of course. I might have to call in some outside expertise, though. As long as they keep their mouth shut, I'm fine. You're a lifesaver. Don't spread it around. In my line of work, that'll get me fired. I hung up with a sigh. If only the rest of the case could be handled this easily. I found nothing else in the temple. Pippa's room was clean, and my blessed oak didn't even chirp during any of my interrogations with the rest of Estros's priesthood. Their stories all matched the high priestesses. Run ragged by the near flooding of their temple, none of them had been in any shape to stalk the altar in the middle of the night. My uneasy feeling remained, simmering beneath the surface. It burned on my skin. Maybe I was too close to this case, given my experience. Or maybe that was exactly why Themia had chosen me. I took a bottle of sunscreen from my satchel and applied my third layer of the day. Even five years on, the sun felt like a spotlight. Andy came up behind me, his tie stuffed into his pocket, waving a list of the Marwal's contact information. A little tan never hurt anyone. You don't tan at all. Of their own accord, my eyes zeroed in on where the crisp white collar of his shirt opened revealing an inch of his bare, dark skin. I snatched the information out of his hand and turned away before Andy could notice my gaze. Too late, I realized as he chuckled behind me. So where are we off to? I headed to my car. I'm off to interview the Marwal family. That may not be the first place you want to look. Andy rushed to keep pace with me, scuffing his ridiculous dress shoes in the gravel. Are you kidding? Andy, they don't even know their daughter, sister, whomever, is dead. They're also the only suspects we have, other than, you know, Mr. Windy himself. The lack of breeze was starting to feel disconcerting. Mr. Windy has a wife, Andy said. Her seaside temple isn't two miles from here. What, you're thinking this is a jealousy thing? There was certainly precedent for it. God takes a new mistress, wife gets jealous, lightning bolts rain down, someone winds up turned into a swan. Tale as old as time. I heard Estros and Tillamon were a pretty chill couple. Comparatively. They might be chill, but when gods mess around, sometimes their worshippers take it personally. Besides... Estros taking off without a word, right after his snuggle muffin turns up dead? Pretty suspicious. I ignored the prickle of nervous heat that traced its way up my spine. I'll agree to that, as long as you never use the word snuggle muffin again. Estros isn't exactly helping his case by lying low. And if anyone knows where he is, it would be his wife, don't you think? Interrogate a god? I brushed my fingers against my blessed oak. As a priestess of Themia, I investigated human crimes, meted out human justice. But what if a god was standing in the way of human justice? Did that count? Fine, I'll check out the Temple of Tides. I opened my car door and slid into the driver's seat. Andy tugged at the handle of the passenger door. You mean we will? I tilted my head to one side and pretended to give it some thought. Andy tugged at the handle again. I shot him an apologetic smile and keyed the engine to life. It's not that I don't appreciate the help, but I think we better leave this with the professionals. He leapt back with a yelp as I shot the car into reverse and arrowed out of the parking lot. Half an hour later, I slid into the last parking space at the beachfront Temple of Tides. Newly renovated, the modernized structure resembled a massive conch shell half buried in the sand. Worshippers streamed in and out through gleaming steel and glass doors set into the base. Walking into the temple lobby was like entering an exclusive spa. 
Everything was painted a tasteful cream, periwinkle, or sea foam. Every flat surface boasted a bowl of sea stones, a miniature sand garden, or a display of starfish organized according to size. A trio of ornamental fountains burbled in one corner. I approached the blue cassocked priest at the front desk and resisted the urge to whisper like I was in a library. My name is Iris Thoreau. I serve at the whim of Themia, the Huntress of Justice. I'm... What was the pantheonic equivalent of can I speak to your manager? I have a few questions for Tillamon, the goddess of tides. The priest gave me a cool smile. The goddess welcomes prayers from all who are questioning. No, no, I'm conducting an investigation. I don't understand. I mean, I'm working a case, and the fulfillment of that case requires assistance from Tillamon. For direct intercessions, she's fully booked until the end of the year. I could put you on a wait list. What about your high priest, then? That's a separate wait list. Screw your wait list. I shot past him toward the double doors leading into the inner workings of the temple. I rattled both handles uselessly for a good five seconds while the priest looked on with a smirk. I'm afraid that area is restricted. Ordained tide priests only. Okay, listen. Turning around, I squinted to read the Mother of Pearl name tag pinned to the front of his cassock. Listen, Cedric. I know you're only protecting your goddess, but I'm on a specific mission from another goddess. Do we really want to have the my patron is bigger than your patron discussion right now? Cedric held his ground. You're on Tillamon's home turf now. Unless you have a personal writ from Themia herself, you'll just have to wait along with everyone else. Never mind. I threw up my hands and slumped into one of the disgustingly gorgeous hand-carved lobby chairs as Cedric vanished back behind those infuriating double doors. I'd never met Tillamon in person, but if her punctilious, boot-licking priesthood was anything to go by, gods forbid a grain of sand go astray in a place like this. That gives me an idea. A few minutes later, I rapped on the desk with my oak. Hey, hey, do you guys have a plumber on staff, or... Cedric, when he deigned to respond, gave a startled shout as he splashed into the growing puddle rippling across the lobby. What in hell's happened? I glanced behind me at the trio of ornamental fountains overflowing onto the marble floor and shrugged. I think they're broken. Oh, for Tillamon's sake, this always happens when I'm on shift. As the priest dashed to repair the fountains, I swung past him and through the doors just as they were closing. I had 30 seconds maximum before he realized the mess of sand and sea stones clogging their pipes hadn't happened by accident. While less ostentatious, the inner workings of Tillamon's temple were just as orderly and efficient. Someone had even inlaid a path of blue shells into the floor's mosaic pattern, leading to what I presumed was the main shrine. At least I hoped it led to the main shrine, or at least to someone important. I followed that path, turning left, then right, then right again. Shouts echoed behind me, along with the clatter of angry feet. Cursing beneath my breath, I broke into a run. A door to the right of me opened, and I swerved to avoid running headlong into a novice carrying more jars of starfish. No running in the temple, she shouted after me. Take it up with Themia, I said. The blue shells curved down a series of staircases, spiraling deeper into the earth as the sounds of pursuit gained on me. After what seemed like forever, I stumbled to a halt in front of a set of stone doors inset with chunks of live coral and amethysts. Without stopping to think, I yanked them open. I found myself in an underground chamber carved of white stone, with a round pool scooped out of the center. The water glowed. Or maybe that was just the goddess floating within it. I stumbled to a halt before I completely embarrassed myself and pitched headfirst into the water. Welcome, Justix Thoro, Telamon, goddess of tides, boomed. We've been expecting you. We? Iris, hey. 
Andy waved at me from the other side of the pool. He lifted a glass of cucumber water in a mock salute. For one moment of pure shock, I forgot I was standing in front of a full-fledged water deity. What the hells are you doing here? Andy grinned. His scales gleamed in the watery half-light of the shrine. You'd already know that if you hadn't ditched me back at Estros's place. But I'm being rude. Let me introduce you to my sister, Tillamon. Tillamon? Iris. Iris. Tillamon. You're listening to Gods and Lies. Narrated by Carrie Height and Sarah Malo Christensen. Produced by Realm. Your portal to another world. Realm. Listen away. Gods and Lies is written by Elizabeth Vale, produced by Marco Palmieri, and executive produced by Molly Barton. Audio production, sound design, editing, and theme music are by Amanda Rose Smith.